It's no secret that JavaScript can be a little bit tricky to work with. So for example, here's an array and it has the values one, two, and three, and we're iterating through the array and we log out all of the values. So you would expect that we would get one, two, and three. But if I actually run this, you'll see we get zero, one, and then two. So this is one of those common mistakes I see in JavaScript that people sometimes write the code and then don't realize it for a while down the line when it causes some error. So what exactly is happening here? Well, we should be logging out the values one, two, and three, but we're using a for in loop, not a for of loop. So a for in loop is meant to iterate through the keys in an object. It is not meant for arrays. So the keys in the object of this array, because remember arrays are actually just objects in JavaScript, are going to be the indices. So we've indexed zero, one, and two. So if instead we did for of here instead of for in, and I run this again, you'll see now we do get one, two, and three. You also notice that these are a different color. So these are actually numbers, at least in my IDE, it's going to show them in sort of this orangish color. Whereas before we had strings because those were the actual keys of the object. And we can see that if we go back to the for in loop and then come down here and also log out the type. So let's say type of our value, then we will see that we actually have zero, one, and two as strings. But if we go back to for of as we should, we have one, two, and three as numbers. So the actual values from the array. And of course, this isn't the only way you can do this. You could also use a for each loop. So you could do something like array dot for each and you'll see this is going to autocomplete for me. And we could do something like console log and our value and type of the value. And you'll see here we do again get one, two, and three as numbers. Another common JavaScript mistake I see even advanced developers making is forgetting to freeze objects as well as using freeze incorrectly. So here we have some config. So we can see it has an API set to v1 and we log out the config and we have that object. However, this config can change. It's just like any other JavaScript object. So I can do something like config.api is going to be equal to v2. And maybe this is what you want, but oftentimes objects like configs, we want to be completely immutable in our actual code. We want to make sure that nothing accidentally changes them down the line. And this can be incredibly important when you have a very big code base where you're using a lot of different libraries and things like this. And you just want to make sure that nothing ever happens where that object is going to change. And the way we can do this is simply using object.freeze. So we're going to call object.freeze and we're going to pass in this object that we have. And now you'll see if I do this again, well, we're already getting this underlined in red to tell me, hey, we're trying to assign to a read only variable. And you can also see it's typing this, even though I'm using JavaScript in my IDE here, it's going to show the type. And this is now a read only object. So if I do try to run this, it's actually going to give me an error saying we cannot assign to read only property API of our object. So this is not going to work. Now a note here is if you're not in struct mode, it's actually just going to not do anything. So it's not going to let you edit it, but it's also not going to throw an error. So there is a little difference there, but most of the time you should be working in strict mode anyways. And it's actually almost hard to not be in strict mode in a modern environment. Now, I do want to point out though, that there is a common pitfall with object.freeze. And that's that thinking that the whole thing is completely immutable. And that's actually not the case. So for example, what if our API, instead of being V1 was another object. So let's get rid of V1 and open up another object. And let's say in here we had say a URL and this was going to be just example.com. And now we wanted to come in here and say our config.api.url is now going to be something else. So let's just say something else.com. Well, this you can see is no longer underlined in red and I can run this and we do actually update the URL. And the reason for that is that the top level object is frozen. So if I did config.api was this string, this is not going to work because we cannot change the API. However, we can change things nested in the API. The reason being that the API still points to the same object. That object changed, but it is the same object. It's at the same place in memory. So essentially just know that with object.freeze, you are freezing the top level of an object, but if you need nested objects to be frozen, you're going to need to either just do that manually or use some different library for it, or you can very easily write your own library that just 
goes through every level of an object and freezes everything possible. And another thing you can do to improve as a JavaScript developer is to give today's sponsor JetBrains a try. And specifically, I'm referring to the WebStorm IDE that I've been using in this whole video. So if you're unfamiliar, WebStorm is an IDE built for JavaScript and TypeScript development. So it's a ton of features for this just built in straight out of the box, nothing that you need to install or anything like that. So for example, here I have a function set counter. It takes in an element. You can see it has some count and maybe this increments somehow. And then we have some text with the count set to whatever this count is. And we set the elements inner text to be our text. You can see there's a few cool things happening here. First of all, we have this show usages button. So if I click this, you can see this is the only usage of it. If of course I added another usage and then I click show usages again, we will now have both of the usages there. So that's kind of cool. And another thing you've probably noticed is that we have all of these types and I'm not even using TypeScript, but it's still able to detect the types and sort of show me what types we have. We also have this underline next to text. And if I hover here, you'll see it says local variable text is redundant. And the reason being that, well, if I click this, it'll fix it. I could just have this be an inline variable. There's no reason to have this intermediate variable of the text. So really it's just doing a great job of helping you better understand your code and make that code a little bit cleaner. And previously I haven't talked about WebStorm much on this channel, not because it wasn't good, because frankly it always has been a very good IDE, but simply because it wasn't free. And I try to make sure that I'm always talking about things that are as accessible to as many people as possible, especially those just getting started and learning how to code. But that's where this major change has actually come from, and that's that WebStorm is now free for non-commercial use. So this means if you're just learning how to code, or maybe you're working on some side project as a hobby, or even working on something like open source development, you can use WebStorm completely for free. So if you do want to give it a try, there's going to be a link at the top of the description. Another common mistake I see in JavaScript a lot has to do with this quirk of floating point arithmetic. And you might have seen the quirk before, but it does actually come up in real examples, and you need to know how to handle it. So here we have a number, which is 0.1 plus 0.2, and we check if the number is 0.3. If it is, we log out equal, but we're actually not going to log out anything. And the reason for that is that if we were to log out just our number here, you would see it's actually going to be 0.3, a bunch of zeros and a four. And I'm not going to get into the math of why exactly this works, but it has to do with the fact that computers just can't be super exact when we have these long decimals. So they end up doing a little bit of weird math and rounding, and we end up with things like 0.3, a bunch of zeros, and a four. So how exactly do we handle this? Well, we need to use a threshold. So what I'm going to do is come over here, and instead of doing our num, what I'm going to say is math.absolute value of our number minus whatever we want. So let's say 0.3, and we want this to be less than some threshold. So let's say less than, and a common threshold we use is going to be number dot epsilon. And if I hover over this, you can see number dot epsilon, essentially what it is, is the difference between one and the smallest floating point number greater than one. So it's a very, very, very small number. And if I run this, you'll see we do now get equal. So these values are considered equal by this threshold. And if say this was 0.35 and I run this again, we no longer get equal because these numbers are not equal. And of course, this isn't going to be 100% precise because we are allowing this threshold, but it is going to be sort of the best thing we can do. Now it is also worth noting that we don't always want to use this number dot epsilon. Sometimes this isn't actually going to be big enough. So for example, if I had 1000.1, and 1000.2, the result here should be 2000.3. But if I run this, it is not going to be equal. That is because simply this threshold is not big enough. Now, I could do something like 2000 times and increase the magnitude of this threshold and that would work. Or you could just manually define some threshold of what you're comfortable with. So maybe something like 0.01, run this and now they are equal. But if say we wanted 2001, now they are no longer equal. So just know that when comparing floating point numbers, you usually do want to be using some threshold and oftentimes it'll be number dot epsilon. However, if you have larger numbers, that's maybe not going to be a big enough threshold and you can just manually set some threshold yourself, such as 0.01 or whatever might work good enough for your own scenario. A common mistake I see in JavaScript is in trying to detect if a value is an object. So for example, here we have const x and it is just this empty object. We use type ups. We say, if the type of X is strictly equal to object, then we're going to log out object. You see, we do log out object because we have an object here. And if I made X say something like 10, we would log out nothing because we no longer have an object. However, this actually doesn't work. For example, what if I had null? Well, null, the type of null is actually object. I'm not going to go into why exactly this quirk exists. It's 
kind of interesting, but for now, just know type of null is actually object. So what that means is we also need to say and x does not equal null. And that's going to cover this case for us. So now we no longer say object. And if we go back to an object, we are again going to say object. However, there's still one more case this doesn't fully cover, and that's going to be arrays, because arrays are technically objects. And maybe you want this behavior, and maybe you don't, but if you don't want this behavior, then you need to come in here and also say, and not array.isArray, and you can see it's actually auto-completing it for me, so array.isArrayX. And now if I run this, we again don't get object for the array, we don't get object for null, but if we put in an object, we would in fact get object. So essentially the key point here is just to know that the type of operator does have some quirks, especially when dealing with objects, and that you need to also check for null manually and you need to check for an array manually. I love arrow functions just as much as the next guy, but can we please stop overusing them and stop making this super common mistake with them? So here I have a person object with a name of Connor, as well as a greet function. And this function is an arrow function, and all it does is say console.log, hello, my name is, and then this.name, that we call person.greet. But if I run this, you'll see we actually get an error. Cannot read property of undefined reading name. And the problem here is that this is undefined. And the reason for that is that we're using an arrow function. And arrow functions do not create their own this binding. So for example, on an object, we cannot actually reference the same object. So the way we can solve this is very simple. Just use the syntax that was actually made for this. And that is the method syntax. So I'm going to get rid of this arrow here. And then we'll simply have greet like this. And now greet is a method on this person. And this is going to exist. So I can run this again and we get hello, my name is Connor. So the point here is not to never use arrow functions. I use them all the time, but just use them properly. I think they're great for things like callbacks. So for example, a for each loop, you probably want to pass in an arrow function. However, things like the top level of objects and honestly, even top level functions, I don't really like using arrow functions mainly for this reason. Optional chaining in JavaScript is great, but I think it's being overused quite often. So for example, here I have this config with an API and that API has a URL. Then I have a function to get an API key, which is going to return the config.api.key, but we're using optional chaining. And I log out get API key of our config, and you can see we get undefined. And the reason for this is simply because there is no key. Of course, if I had a key here and say, this is just example, like it auto completed for me, you'll see we do log out example. But if we get rid of this key, again, we get undefined. And this might be okay, right? This might be what you want, but I would argue it's, probably not actually what you want because you probably have some reason that you need API keys to always exist. And maybe this is the case that some APIs have a key and some don't, and you do actually just want it to be undefined if it doesn't. And that's fine, this is working as expected. But if this is the case where there should just always be an API key, why are we using optional chaining? We should be throwing an error if that key doesn't exist. So we could either just not use optional chaining and have it simply throw the error. Although sometimes if you're using like TypeScript, you might run into some error with TypeScript with this. So then people say, okay, I'll just put in the optional chaining. But to me, that sort of defeats the purpose because errors exist for a reason and we don't want to always make errors silent. So what I would do instead is just come up here and do an if statement and say, hey, if config, and we can use optional chaining here, dot API dot key, equals null, so this is going to check for null or undefined, then in this case, let's throw a new error missing API key. Otherwise, let's return config.api.key and down here, we no longer need to optional chain. So if I run this again, you'll see we do get this missing API key. And then if I put the key back, we do get example. And I don't even know if this is a perfect example of this, and I'm not saying that you should never be using optional chaining, but just if you see yourself using optional chaining to make some linter be happy or to make TypeScript happy, but in reality, you think that there should always be some value there, think about either retyping it in TypeScript or whatever you're using, or think about a way that you can actually make good error messages rather than using that optional chaining. So thanks again to JetBrains for sponsoring this video. Like I mentioned before, WebStorm is now free for non-commercial use, and it has tons of great features specifically for JavaScript and TypeScript completely baked in to the IDE. So I highly recommend you give it a try, and there's going to be a link at the top of the description.